Thank you, John, for praying. Especially important to be praying for, uh, again, like, like India, be um, mindful of the numbers that are spiking. We have many families within the church who are from India and um, have relatives who are suffering in these days. Um, and I hope you're still praying for, um, during this season of Ramadan, for uh, the Muslim community around the world. Uh, this morning's video uh, from PrayerCast was about the Persian population around the world. And I, again, just so uniquely touches our congregation as we have Persians within the church too. So uh, lots of reasons to keep your, uh, your heart in the posture of prayer as you read the newspaper in these days. A few years ago, I was preparing our living room in Rwanda for a Saturday night movie and pizza uh, experience. That's what was, was our tradition. And uh, there I was standing on a tall chair, uh, kind of like a stool, but really a chair, but it's really tall. And there was a perch on the wall, so I'm reaching up to hang a white sheet, the two top corners of the white sheet, so we can project a movie onto the wall. And so I'm reaching down with one hand to receive ironically nursing textbooks from Lori Cruz here in the church. She sent them over with our first container. I'm reaching down to receive these huge textbooks to place them up on the corners of this sheet to hold this, uh, this sheet in place. And um, again, with both arms stretched in different directions, standing precariously on this chair, I kind of lost my balance and I, I went perpendicular above that chair, kind of like a belly flop, and I landed on my ribs, my ribs coming down on this solid wooden pole, and uh, I, I, I felt a little bit of pain, so I laid back on the, on the floor, and uh, well, fractured ribs hurt. This week we come to Philippians chapter 4. Philippians chapter 4, by the way, the title for this sermon, The Fracture of Joy, we have a woman in the church who actually had a fracture this week, and uh, it was a bit ironic to let her know what the title of this sermon was, um, The Fracture of Joy. This week, we, or this, this week, we launch into the final chapter of Philippians. This little letter, dripping with joy, becomes extremely practical this week as we uh, look at this final chapter and then into subsequent weeks. This morning's text is about fractures. It's about fractures. Fractures inflicted by conflict between Christians. Fractures inflicted by conflict. In our text for this morning, Philippians chapter 4, verses 1 through 11, Paul responds to a particular disagreement that exists among two women within the church in Philippi. How about you? Have you ever experienced a fracture in a relationship, a conflict? Of course you have. If you're human, you've experienced conflict in some way. Fractures, conflicts can arise in marriage, they can arise within families, within friendships, among co-workers. Fractures, conflict in relationships is expensive. Fractures are exhausting. Fractures are distracting. They can adversely affect everything around you, everyone around you. Fractures, conflicts cause great pain. But the gospel Based on what we see in our text this morning, the gospel prescribes a means for healing fractured relationships. So let me encourage you to open your Bible to Philippians chapter 4. Philippians chapter 4. There's a lot that we can learn from Paul's, uh, from Paul's response to this particular situation among these two women in this ancient church, there's a lot that we can learn from his response, recognizing that these few verses are not a margin, they're not a side note, they're not an epilogue, but they're a part of what Paul is trying to present to these Philippian Christians about the significance of the gospel in their lives. So there's a lot that we can learn from, again, from Paul's response to this conflict among these two women for how we then would respond to conflict that would arise within our lives as well. The gospel prescribes a means for healing fractured relationships. How? We're going to look at four commitments represented by four key words, four commitments for healing fractured relationships. Let's look at the first word, the first commitment. The first commitment is love. Love. Be committed to kindling gospel-saturated affections. Love. I'm going to read the first part of verse 1 in Philippians chapter 4. Paul writes, Therefore, my brothers, 
whom I love and long for, my joy and crown. Chapter 4 opens up with a tremendous amount of affectionate language. Paul knows that inasmuch as he's been made a child of God, in that family of God, as a child of God, he has brothers and sisters. He has siblings in Christ. Listen to how Paul describes these Philippians as he addressed them, as he addresses them. He calls them the beloved. Twice, in fact, he calls them the beloved. Therefore, my brothers whom I love, and then again at the very end of that verse, my beloved. Of course, they're the beloved of God. Of course, God loves them. But what's so significant is not only does God love them, but Paul loves them as well. And the love of God, having exploded within Paul's heart, has exploded in such a way that he, he says he longs for them. He longs. There's, there's something that's pulling his heart in the direction of them. Even though they're a thousand miles away, he's on the Italian peninsula in Rome. They're in Macedonia, a long ways away. A thousand miles away, and his heart is being drawn in the direction of them. Because Paul loves others who have been loved by Christ. So Paul's affections, Paul's affections are not baseless, but they're established in the fact that their lives together have been intertwined in Christ. When Paul stands in the presence of Christ on that day and the day of vindication, Paul knows that there in the presence of Christ, there together with the Philippians, it will be joy for him because of the fact that their lives have been so intertwined as they work together for each other in the gospel. He says, He says, whom I love and long for, my joy and my crown. Not just his joy, but also his crown. A crown is is an object of vindication. When you you finish the race, you you receive a crown. And and Paul, on that day, when he he will have finished the task of, of, of working for the progress of the gospel and the lives of other people, when he reaches that day, the crown will be a, a vindication. In other words, Paul is saying that, that their, their future is bound up together with each other. So Paul's love for the Philippian believers is ignited by their shared past, and it is ignited by the, by the confidence of a shared future. But here's the thing. Again, Paul's not just filling space. He's not just filling space with, with, with dears and loves and all, these, all this affectionate language. What Paul is saying to them, what Paul is describing about his heart for them, is to be normative among believers. Going all the way back to Philippians chapter 1, one of the verses that we covered in the first few weeks, Philippians chapter 1, verse 7, in the beginning of this book, Paul also describes his affections for these Christians Chapter 1, verse 7, he says about those affections, it is right for me to feel this way about all of you because I hold you in my heart. In other words, love between believers ought to be normative. They ought, Paul ought to feel this way about other Christians. So too ought we. If you want to see healing in fractured relationships, it needs to begin with kindling gospel-saturated affections in Christ. Uh, Starting a fire is a bit complicated if you lack patience, and I'm the kind of person that I lack patience. So how do I start a fire? I'm not telling you you should do this, but... uh, but it's easier, it's easier just to get a little bit of gas and dump it on there and then stand a few feet away, notice the safety precaution, and then toss the flame and toss the match into the air and boom! But what happens to that kind of a fire? It goes out really quickly because as soon as those fumes are gone, it goes out. So how do you really start a fire? Well, you, you take pine needles, you take small sticks, maybe you take some dryer lint, And you build a small pile, and you light it on fire, and you see that little flicker of a flame. And then you stick your face down in the ash, and you blow softly. Softly. Even that was too too, too hard. And then you add a few more sticks, and you add bigger sticks and bigger sticks, and finally, maybe after like 20 minutes, you can finally start adding something of substance. But the point is that it takes a lot of time and a lot of patience, and a lot of focus. It's the same way when you are trying to ignite gospel-saturated affections towards someone toward whom your affections have grown cold. 
It takes time, patience, and focus to rekindle those affections. It's comprised of a lot of small steps to rekindle that kind of love that perhaps has grown cold. But hear me clearly, it is impossible to bring healing to fractured relationships if you remain bitter and angry. You need to move in the direction of love. You need to change your posture. So if you need a place to begin, if you need a, pl- if you need a few twigs, if you need some, uh, some, some pine needles, if you need some dryer lint, let me offer you a few ideas this morning. Try contemplating the shared identity that you have in Christ. Just contemplate the shared identity that you have. The fact that if you have conflict with another believer, that, that you share some significant things in Christ. You may not share political views. You may not share ideas on social things. But you share something significant in Christ. Let your heart be warmed as you pray for that person. Contemplate your shared destiny. Recognize not only do you have a common history, but you also have a common trajectory for the future. Contemplate that in prayer and allow the contemplation of these things to slowly build that fire. And it may not happen immediately, but over time, as you, as you warm your affections slowly and deliberately and with, and with focus, you're moving in the direction of kindling gospel-saturated affections towards your brother or sister in Christ. Martin Luther King Jr., in a sermon entitled uh, Strength to Love, says this, Returning hate for hate multiplies hate, adding deeper darkness to a night already devoid of stars. Darkness cannot drive out darkness. Only light can do that. Hate cannot drive out hate. Only love can do that. So how do we begin to bring healing to fractured relationships? Here's the first commitment, love love. Second commitment, stand. Be committed to doing all that the gospel requires. Stand. Stand firm. Stand firm in the Lord. That's the second part of chapter 4, verse 1. Paul says, stand firm thus in the Lord, my beloved. Stand firm in the Lord. Now, this isn't the first time that Paul has told them to stand firm. In chapter 1, verse 27, he said something very similar. He used the same exact word to stand firm. Let me read chapter 1, verse 27. Paul says, Only let your manner of life be worthy of the gospel of Christ. You might remember that illustration of, on the one hand, you've got you, you have scales, and on the one side, you've got the gospel, and on the other side, it's your life. Demonstrate the value, the worth of, of all that you've received in Christ by, by balancing the scales. And the gospel is of eternal value. So, so, so live that out in your life, the fact that, 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 that the gospel is eternally valuable. Paul says, let your manner of life be worthy of the gospel of Christ, so that whether I come and see you or am absent, I may hear that you are, here it is, standing firm in one spirit with one mind, striving side by side for the faith of the gospel. Here's the idea with standing firm. See, Paul, Paul's going to unload all sorts of great doctrinal and theological truths throughout this book. Chapter 2, he's going to talk about these, these elevated doctrinal principles about how Jesus, the Son of God, uh, being in the, in the form of God, did not consider equality with God something to be grasped. Enormous doctrinal truths. But Paul's intent is that they would take all that theology, all of that doctrine, all that he's been talking about, and stand firm in those things. Practical application, practical living, that it would make a difference in the way that they live their lives. The resolve to stand firm in what the gospel preaches and what the gospel prescribes especially when you are in a difficult or contentious relationship, when you are in the middle of a very difficult situation of conflict, the resolve to stand firm in the Lord in those times is a great act of worship. To stand firm in those times when you, when you just want to yell and you just want to scream and you just want to fight, to stand firm in the Lord in that space. That, friends, that's worship. That's beautiful worship to the Lord. Whatever the circumstances, note that the call in this text is not to stand firm in your position. No, the call is to stand firm in the Lord. 
The story is told of an old man who was convinced that there was a global conspiracy. You know, conspiracies are a thing these days. An old man believed there was a conspiracy to turn all the clocks of the world ahead 20 minutes. The man said, I do not accept this. No one is going to rob me of 20 minutes. Those are my 20 minutes. So he set his watch according to his convictions. When everyone else's watch read 11 o'clock, his read 1040, which meant that he was late for appointments, late to the airport, late to work, and it follows that the resolution to stand firm in his position cost him greatly. Friends, if you're going to see healing in fractured relationships, the, the, the exhortation of this text is that you be willing to stand firm in the right place. Stand firm in the Lord. Stand firm in all that he requires of you. Stand firm in all that the gospel requires of your life. Recognize, like Paul, that, that, that just like he says all throughout chapter 3, that you are not yet perfect. That it's possible on some things that you might be wrong. That you have not yet been made complete. Have a spirit of humility, a spirit of learning, and a spirit of repentance before the Lord. Stand, that's what it looks like to stand firm in the Lord. Have a willingness to accept that you could be wrong, even you, and that your natural response will probably not be the godly response. Stand firm where? Stand firm in the Lord, not necessarily in your position. The best thing you can do for the healing of fractured relationships, the best thing you can do for the prevention of future fractures, is to stand firm in the right place. Stand firm in the Lord in all that he requires of you. To make it your daily habit to take hold of Christ. That's, what, that's how you stand firm in the Lord. You stand firm in the Lord by being in his word, by being in prayer, by daily making it your habit to take hold of the one who in the past has already taken a hold of you. Pursue him, seek him, seek his mind in prayer, seek his mind in his word, and stand firm in him. So again, how do we bring healing to fractured relationships? Number, number one, love. Number two, stand. Number three, think. Think. We must be concerned to think like gospel people. Let me read now uh, verse 2 in our text. Paul writes, I entreat Euodia and I treat, entreat Syntyche to agree in the Lord. I entreat Euodia and I entreat Syntyche to agree in the Lord. So here in this verse, Paul calls attention to a particular historical situation about which we know very little. In fact, all we know is verse 2 and verse 3 in this chapter 4 of Philippians. Although we know very little about the situation, we know very little about the history, we do know a, a few things. First, we know that it must not have been trivial. Like this was not a simple disagreement. This was disagreement enough that it made the headlines in the book of Philippians. And then in addressing the conflict, notice that Paul doesn't take sides. In fact, it's really remarkable the parallel structure that Paul uses in addressing these two, two particular women. Notice how he even repeats the word entreat, as if the second person might say, if he didn't repeat the, the verb entreat, that perhaps it was particularly addressed to one individual. He says, I entreat you, Odia. And then he says it again, I entreat Syntyche. He's showing impartiality in the way that he addresses this particular historical situation. Now, what does he say to these two women who disagree? He says to them to agree in the Lord. Literally, to have the same mind in the Lord. To have the same mind in the Lord. Now, we need to be clear about what Paul is not saying. By telling them to agree in the Lord, Paul is not telling them to have perfect alignment in what you think. No, he's saying have perfect alignment in how you think. It's not have perfect alignment in what you think. It's have perfect alignment in how you think. There's a Christian way to think about conflict and fractured relationships. 
Thomas J. Watson was the CEO of the International Business Machines Corporation, International Business Machines with the acronym IBM. Uh, he was the CEO from 1914 to 1956. In the early days, IBM produced commercial scales, time, time recorders, tabulators, punch cards. Anyways, Thomas Watson never tired of reiterating the same message, the same important activity for success in the industry. Here it is. Think. Think. In a memo to his management team in 1920, Watson wrote, in short, the first duty of every man or woman in any executive position is to follow the model of this business. Think. How you think is incredibly important if you intend to bring healing to relationships that are fraught with conflict. How you think about yourself, how you think about the other, and how you think about God. Let's break this down for a minute. How you think about yourself. How do you think about yourself in conflict? Is your impulse to say, well, I have my needs. I have my needs to be self-occupied with your needs. Or do you think about yourself in the sense that you see the other person's needs and you hear the other person's perspective as well? To what extent do you think about the needs or perspective of the other? Think. This is something that Paul has actually shown us. In Philippians chapter 2, verse 26, he talked about Epaphroditus. Epaphroditus was one who thought not of his own needs, but thought about the needs. In fact, his heart was pulled in the direction of the needs of other people. Uh, in chapter 2, verse 26, speaking of Epaphroditus, Paul writes, He has been longing for all of you and has been distressed because you heard that he was, or he heard that you, that you heard that he was ill. In other words, Epaphroditus was, was mindful and burdened by what what was concerning other people. How you think about yourself, how you think about the other, how do you think about the other in conflict? You see, there are people who say, well, I got to protect myself. I got to be really careful. I need to protect myself. But that's not the model that's held up in the gospel. See, the, go the gospel holds up a different model. Again, the book of Philippians, you see, this is systemic to what Paul has been communicating in the book of Philippians. Philippians chapter 2, verse 8, in the example of Jesus, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Why? For you and me. For you and me. You see, there's our natural impulse towards self-protection, but the impulse of Jesus was to relinquish control and to serve the purposes of God in the lives of the other. That's how you think about yourself and how you think about the other. Now, also, this thinking affects how we think about God. You, you see, sometimes we want to drag the outcome into our own hands, and we say, I will not have peace, I will not have joy until I know how this is going to turn out, and it better turn out for my, for, for, in, in my best interest. Some people, they, they do everything that they can to ensure that it ends well for them. But again, that's not gospel living. Do you remember the example of Paul in Philippians chapter 1, verse 19, from again earlier in this series? Paul says, I will rejoice, for I know that through your prayers and the help of the Spirit of Jesus Christ, this will turn out for my deliverance. He's talking about his imprisonment. This will turn out for my deliverance. But he's not talking about deliverance because Caesar makes the decision. He knows that his deliverance is secured, not in this life, but on that day of vindication when he stands before the Lord, even though things may have never been resolved in this life, he knows that on that day he will stand vindicated even, in the, even after having lived a messy life, he will stand vindicated on that day for having stood firm in the Lord. You see, there are two ways that we can think about the Lord when it comes to our conflict. We can think, I need to be justified right now. I need this to turn out for my best interest right now. Or we can say, God, I, I, I have no idea where this is all headed, but I trust you. Help me to honor you and obey you and submit to you in this in this process as I endure in you, for you. So I ask you, to what extent do you think to trust God 
for closure and vindication in that conflict or that fracture that needs healing. Yeah, you need to be careful about what you think. But there's a Christian way to think. There's a Christian way to think. How we think is is just as important, if not more important. Because oftentimes in conflict, people in conflict, they get bogged down in the details. You need to say, see it the way that I see it. You need to see it the way that I see it. Like, but the problem is that we're arguing over facts. The reality is we ought to be thinking in the same kind of way. Not the same things, but the same way. So how do we bring healing to fractured relationships? First, love. Warm the affections by moving in the direction of love. Secondly, stand, be concerned that you yourself are standing in the Lord and not necessarily in your position. Number three, be very careful about how you're thinking, how you're thinking toward yourself, toward the other, and toward the Lord in that conflict. And then finally, number four, the fourth commitment, receive. We must be ready to receive gospel-oriented help from the people who are around us. I'm wondering which of these four might be the most difficult. It feels like all four are pretty difficult. But listen to verse 3 as Paul uh, continues to unpack this. Verse 3, Paul writes, Yes, I ask you also, true companion, help these women who have labored side by side with me in the gospel together with Clement and the rest of my fellow workers whose names are written in the book of life. This last verse is a bit cryptic because we have no idea who this person is. We don't know who Paul is addressing. He, just, he, he says in the second person, I ask you also, true companion. Who's the true companion? If you really want some interesting reading sometime, just try to figure out who that true companion is because some people say it's Paul's wife. And Paul had a wife? That's for, it, but some people say perhaps that's Paul's wife. And other people say perhaps that's Luke, the, the, the guy that traveled with Paul and wrote the book of Acts. There are all sorts of interesting theories about who this true companion is. But the truth is we do not. No. However, there are a couple of things that we do know about this true companion. Paul asks this person to inter- intervene and help. And whether it's a he or a she, this person is described with two particular words, true and companion. True. He or she has been tried and tested and is trusted by Paul. They're a true person. Over the course of time, he or she has been shown to have solid character, character that aligns with the course of the gospel. A person who is genuine. This person is the real deal. This person is true. So Paul calls on this true person to intervene in this this conflict that has erupted between these two individuals. But not just true, Paul says that this person is a true companion. That word companion is really interesting because this is the only place in the entire New Testament where this particular word in Greek is used. It's a strange word. It was used by Julius Caesar, obviously outside of Scripture, as a term for a term of flattery for people that loved Rome. It, uh, but I think what Paul's point is here is, is, is to identify this person as a faithful partner, co-worker, comrade in the in the, in the progress, in the movement, in the advancement of the gospel. So Paul says to this person, uh, whether it's a him or a her, we don't know, and perhaps it's to our benefit not to know, Paul says to this person to intervene, he pleads with this person to intervene in this relationship in which there's been a rupture between Euodia and Syntyche. But notice again how Paul pleads with this unnamed person. Paul doesn't add any kind of snarky remarks like, hey, can you help out Syntyche and Euodia, even though, like, you know, Euodia really is in the wrong here. He doesn't add any snarky remarks. He doesn't predispose this unnamed person in in a particular direction. No, without assigning any blame, without making any presumptuous accusations, while still maintaining the dignity of these two individuals, Paul commends these two individuals the compassionate care of a mature believer in Christ. What a beautiful model. Paul entrusts these two women, among whom there there has arisen this rupture. He entrusts these women to the compassionate care 
of a mature follower of Christ who can help them. And Paul says, help these women. It's a great lesson in here for us. If you want to see healing in fractured relationships, you need to be ready and willing to receive help from gospel-oriented people around you. Hear this very clearly. You cannot do it on your own. You need to be ready to receive help from gospel-oriented people around you. I can remember a time when I had reached an impasse with a coworker in ministry. Hey, it happens. All of us come to places where there are impasses and conflict. I had reached an impasse with a coworker in ministry. He wanted to go one direction, I wanted to go another direction. And whereas we might have thought it was just a difference of opinion and a disagreement, the truth was it had great implications for, for ourselves and for those that we worked with as well as the, 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 the community, the larger community that we served in Rwanda. Well, the fractured relationship had the potential to cause problems. And there was an older man, an older man that had experience and who loved the Lord and who had been praying for us anyways, who stepped in and sat down with the both of us. And he listened to both of us. And he helped us to hear each other in a way that we had not previously heard each other. And we came out of that, what was potentially a fractured relationship, we came out of that with healing. Friends, there's no shame in accepting, heal, in accepting help from other people. When you have a fractured relationship, sometimes you need help from people around you. If you want healing in fractured relationships, you need to be ready and willing to help, to, to receive the help of gospel-oriented people around you. This is why I'm a big, big, big capital B, capital I, capital G fan of Christian counseling. We need it. We need people around us who can help us when we reach those places of impasse and fracture. Gospel-oriented help can come from uh, a, a counselor. Gospel-oriented help can come from a pastor. Co Gospel-oriented help can come from a Jesus-loving friend. You know what the best kind of friend is whenever you reach an impasse or a conflict with somebody else? The best kind of friend you can wish for is a friend who loves Jesus, who loves you, and who loves the other person. Because if he loves Jesus and you only, well, you know, Odds are against the other person. And if he doesn't love Jesus, you might be led down a path that you might not necessarily want to go down as a follower of Christ. All of us need help. All of us need help. And there's no shame in accepting it, especially in a community like this. What a beautiful thing to live out the gospel together in a community and help each other. The gospel provides a means for healing fractured relationships. We've looked at four commitments this morning for healing those fractures, according to Paul's letter to the Philippians. Four commitments. Love, stand, think, receive. Love, be committed to kindling gospel-saturated affections. There's no hope for healing if you won't open to the direction of love. It might be a small thing, but to start to fan that flame in the direction of love. Stand. Be committed to doing all that the gospel requires. You, yourself, before you start put, pointing the finger at the other person, you, yourself, be committed to doing all that the gospel requires of you. Think. Be committed to think like gospel-minded people. It's not just what you think, it's how you think. And finally, receive. Be committed to receiving gospel-oriented help from others. Back to that story with which I began. Again, I was trying to hang a sheet using two of Lori Cruz's nursing textbooks on a ledge on our wall so that we could project a movie on a Saturday evening and watch that movie together. And I had one arm up holding the sheet and another arm down receiving the textbooks. And I lost my balance and I flipped up in the air and did a belly flop on a really big wooden post. And I, I, I'm pretty confident that I heard a crack whenever I hit that post. I think I felt the crack. 
or I think I heard the crack, I know I felt the pain. But my assumption was, eh, I just got the wind knocked out of me. It's just a little bend. I'm sure it's just fine. So I laid back on the mattresses, because we always laid out mattresses to watch the movies. And I'm sure the next morning I got up and I thought, I'm going to go for a little run around the neighborhood. And I went outside and I felt this piercing through my body. Here's the thing. You cannot heal wounds by ignoring the pain. If you're experiencing pain in a fracture, in a relationship, friends, pain is an invitation to cry out for help. The beautiful thing about the gospel is that the gospel provides that help. The gospel provides that help. And once you face the reality of the conflict, once you face the reality of the fracture, you can spend the time and the effort to heal. Fractures hurt, but praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. He's offered to us in the gospel a means for healing fractured relationships. Our Heavenly Father, we give great thanks to you that in the gospel we have not just great, beautiful, wonderful doctrine to believe, but we have a way to live. God, may the gospel infuse every aspect of our lives, change our course. May it not just be the things that we believe on paper, but the way that we live from day to day. We thank you, Lord, for the invitation to follow Jesus. We pray that you would would heal relationships in our midst, whether it be between husbands and wives, or whether it be between uh, parents and and children, or whether it be between Christian and Christian, or co-worker and co-worker. God, may the principles of your word apply deeply in our hearts today as we move in the direction, even if it's only a step, move in the direction of healing based on what is laid upon us by the gospel. We thank you for the beauty of the gospel and how you've modeled it for us in Jesus. We pray all these things in his name. Amen.